Recording in progress. Hello. So everybody is settled? All set? Not yet warmed up. Slowly, I think you will warm up slowly. Hello. Audible? Audible, thank you. So very good morning. Before we start the proceedings, I like to play a short clip for you. Inauguration. Inauguration only was a video. Professor Bangalore Najundia Gangadhar, Chikitsa Psychiatry. Dr. Raman Ganga Khedkar, Professor Bangalore Najundia Gangadhar, Chikitsa Psychiatry. So it gives me immense pleasure that Professor Gangadhar is here with us. It was just four days ago that he was in the Ashoka Hall and uh, we all felt it was a very proud moment for us. You know, he was my teacher while I was here in Imans. He has been a teacher actually of all of us, you can say. And uh, this workshop is there for us, specially dedicated to you. Thank you so much. I'll be a PowerPoint. Ah, you change here. No, you can change. No problem. Next one, next one. Great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Indian Psychiatric Society and uh, my colleague, Dr. Shivram, the Department of Integrative Medicine. I think this is in this new hall this is a very inaugural sort of a function so we are today privileged in ways more than one next one please of course we must follow all this covid appropriate behavior mobile phones silent switched off you already got a workshop kit light 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 i think dim curves Ah. So you all have a workbook with you, workshop kit, workbook, good. It is perhaps possible that because of this COVID situation, you might not have had many opportunities to attend in-person programs and on the top of that workshops. So please listen, respond ask, interact. The floor belongs to the participants in a workshop, okay? So you have to do the work and uh, we are the ones who are going to relax and listen to your work, okay? So you are going to make this workshop, okay? This is not a lecture. It's a workshop, so please be all be very active. It would also involve some light physical activity, so I'm sure you are all comfortable with it. If someone not, you please feel free to let that know, washrooms, washrooms are behind on that side for you, okay? So this much is for the housekeeping. We will have uh, some time, we are running a bit late, so we will try to get ourselves on time. We'll try to build a concept about what this mind-body health is about, what this resilience is about, and then we are going to have a formal inauguration. 
followed by then we have the three sessions. One part is going to be dedicated to enhancing the awareness part, which is a lot of work part with us. So we have some interesting exercises for you, mind exercises, body exercises. The later part is with regards to regulation. How can we regulate uh, those things that we recognize, that we need to recognize and how to help ourselves build long-term resilience. Next one, please. Dignitaries, Professor Gangadhar, he is already here. Professor Pratima Murthy, she is going to join us for the inauguration, the director Nimans. Also, my opportunity to welcome you, Professor N. N. Raju, sir. He is the president-elect of Indian Psychiatric Society. <laughs> so he will take office during January 2022, when he becomes the leader of the psychiatric community. So he has been my long-time colleague. Also to welcome Dr. Arun Marwale, or rather Professor Arun Marwale, he is the also the office bearer of Indian Psychiatric Society is the president of the West Zone. Hinal Shah, she is going to join us. She is the chair of the PG committee of Indian Psychiatric Society responsible for the MD psychiatry training related activity. From the Indian Psychiatric Society viewpoint, we are all the resource persons. I am Sanjay Fadke and uh, he is uh, Professor Shivram Bharat, Dr. Bharat. Dr. Hemant, and uh, we will soon have uh, Dr. Kishore also here. Okay. And our friend from uh, Munich, he is our senior friend, he will also be joining online. Okay, next. Okay, so what do we bring to the table? What all are our areas of expertise? I think you should know, so you can ask us questions in that if you like and also not ask us question outside these areas. <laughs> okay, so Professor N. N. Raju and I, we both were involved in um, clinical trials last 20 years or more. And uh, this is a short list of some of the molecules, the clinical trials in which we have been involved, starting from very early development, as you may know, phase two to phase three, phase four. These are perhaps all the medicines which you use in your daily practice or are learning to use. So we were really very lucky to get a very inside view of these medicines while they were being made. So we have been involved with uh, intervention trials, quetiapine, asinapine, aloperidon, cariprazine, luracidon, paliperidon, various forms, aripiprazole, respiridon, practically the whole list of it, which is nice. Then. We were also involved with disaster management. So I spent many years in disaster management, nearly 10 years. Professor Arun Marwale was also part of disaster management activity. And Professor Gangadhar was quite active and gave a guidance during the tsunami disaster. So we were all involved into this another dimension, disaster management, disaster epidemiology. And of course, yoga and meditation, which is also a passion for all the people. And the people here, the whole activity, neuroscience of yoga, initiated the research activity initiated by Professor Gangadhar and now carried forward by Dr. Shivram. So you are also going to get a preview to a lot of new research information, you know, perhaps first time. So breaking news sort of information, neuroscience, breaking news of different types, you know, even before it goes into print. Next slide. We live in challenging times. We all know that. And everybody is talking about smart solutions. We all need smart solutions. So we need smart diagnostics. We are interested in smart diagnostics so that we can detect problems early. We can intervene early. We are also interested in problems which bake solutions on large scale, you know, scalable, what is technically called a scalable. A solution which can actually be implemented on hundreds of thousands of people. State of the art science, cutting edge technology, and people, you know, the society, I am sure you also probably all would have noticed that today's patient, they want more active participation into their own treatment. They don't just want to be passive recipient, you know, that I write a prescription, he take up. They are interested that let me also tell. 
what kind of diet should i have what kind of exercise should i do will yoga meditation help will counseling help they are interested you know somehow to actively get involved with so we have to factor in all these aspects next one three approaches in which we comprehend some very basic you know how we understand our patients and how we try to treat them remember three three is a magic number because anything cognitive science research tells us that if we are able to summarize in three points we have a good likelihood you know to remember it in a good nice decent way okay so that's why i try to put it like that as medical doctors our dominant model and this was the discussion on the breakfast table which we were having with professor gangadhar this morning is a biochemical model isn't it we understand people in terms of biochemistry we understand psychiatry in terms of dopamine serotonin acetylcholine this that no medical people understand people in terms of lab reports biochemical lab reports hemogram biochemistry reports of course imaging also you know but the dominant model in medicine today is understanding human beings in biochemical form and the treatment is also biochemical you know pharmacological treatment is all entirely biochemical but there are two other perspectives also you know in which we can understand people second one particularly close to the heart of the psychiatry people experiential level our whole diagnosis our whole understanding of patient today is even today is actually based upon subjective report experience of the patient technically what is it called as what is it called as patient subjective report anybody let me show you this box so people will start talking okay i have a box full of chocolates they are all for you okay so let me see who grabs the first chocolate what is it called as patient's subjective experience na patient aake batata hai i hear voices this that etc what is it called as raise phenomenology come first chocolate of the day good chalo yaar at least they start warming up now nahi kya <laughs> incentivization is very important <laughs> gangadhar sir was telling us this morning okay so we understand people in terms of their subjective experience i feel sad i am feeling happy i am feeling relaxed i am feeling tensed up i am feeling anxious these are all subjective experiences you know that patients tell us based upon which then we make our diagnosis there is a third description also possible whole system biochemical tends to be very molecular you know it tries to get into the at a very molecular level but we can understand actually the whole being as a system also whole system level more biophysical type of description psychologically person is able to express i am at ease or i am at this ease i am not at at ease while as in the physical biophysical way it can be said that the system is either in order or it is in disorder system in order or system in disorder okay similarly our treatment approaches these three treatment approaches pharmacological which is based upon biochemical is like a push blood pressure badh gaya hai so you want to give it a push want to bring it back to normalcy person is sleeping less you want to give it a push want to bring it back to normalcy then there is sometimes another type of intervention which is like a jolt so you give a ect which is like a jolt the you know, system has become too disordered it's like a gaadi gotten off the road so you need a big jolt you know to the system then only it can come back on the road but there could be a third way also you know interventions which are non pharmac which are non pharmac non intervention and what is hidden here is that they could be like nudge it's like a soft intervention but very effective all three are effective what you have to understand is sometimes you need a push sometimes you need a nudge and sometimes you need a jolt they all are important this is not to say that one is more noble than the other next one so now let us try to within 
this understanding try to understand where we can exactly place this whole mind body medicine so of course it is evidence based we all like it isn't it we like to have evidence so it's all luckily evidence based it is helpful to improve the outcome and quality of life help helpful across the entire spectrum of disease you want to intervene early you want to intervene when the person already has disease or you want to rehabilitate and it is helpful not only for psychological disorders you know all all sort of medical disorders it is typically a nudge so it's not a push or a jolt it's a sort of a slow thing which you are trying to easy thing which you are trying to do and it is of a nourishing type you understand nourishing nourishment what does nourishment do to us it helps us sort of flourish it is not exactly a therapy but more of a you can say a training so you give a training to a person the person learns that self care learns the self care are you aware of these terms called nature and nurture what is nature chocolate ka daba kidhar gaya yaar chalo yaar how would a medical man use a technical term for nature what is nature genetic chalo good what is a nurture sorry experiences experiences and uh, in the ah uh, learning and in if if the nature is genetic what is nurture is environment a genetic se linked kya bolte hai epigenetic chalo good who said who said uh, it is uh, learning who said it is epigenetic correct it is learning and it is epigenetic it is applicable across the entire health spectrum it is scalable and we are going to talk about resilience what is resilience what is your idea about resilience everybody i think knows this english term called resilience what is your idea of resilience what is that can you see actually a diagram there a figure what is resilience anybody any volunteer come here come you don't mind if i give you a push hmm? so i try to give him a push like that okay if he falls down he is non resilient hmm? but if he has the ability to push back like okay, a push back yaar push back with strength yaar okay so if i push you and you are also able to push back you know so something which is trying to push you that is resilience okay so raju sir apna bahar gaya hai na so this is otherwise i found a nice acronym for this nn raju nourishing nurturing resilient so nourishing nurturing resilient you know that is what is is the sort of idea you know about uh, this whole thing so we will also therefore discuss in the course of day to day that why is it imperative to embrace mind body medicine how could be a platform for integration of you know the so called medical interventions and non medical interventions current covid scenario is the best example we know that in addition to taking vaccine what we need to do covid appropriate behaviors so behaviors integrated with vaccine behaviors don't work alone vaccine doesn't work alone they actually need to be all put together you know then they actually work even in a better way synergistically and of course what are the opportunities to learn this to research this understand it better next one it already has if you read the if you if you i mean consult professor google it already has all these established applications i need not tell you you can simply google you can find you know that evidence exist for the efficacy of efficacy and safety of mind body medicine for all these long list the list is getting longer actually by the day next one any of you aware what is the history of this mind body split 
we use these two terms, isn't it? We are the mind doctors in the medical fold, all other people are the body doctors, like a cardiologist, neurologist, mm -hmm. nephrologist, this logist, that logist, they are all body doctors. We are the only mind doctors. What is your idea? How did this split happen? Anybody know the history? How did mind-body split in the science? You think mind-body has a split? Are they connected? What is your view? They are connected. So then how did they split? You know, they split, some people say, courtesy this person. He is a French mathematician. His name is Descartes. Descartes is credited with joining algebra and geometry. So he joined <laughs> algebra and geometry, but he split the, because his argument was that at that time, you know, two, three centuries ago, this is old event, not a new event. At that time, perhaps the science was not ready to research mind. You know, they thought that mind is sort of a too amorphous to research body, something more concrete, easily researchable. So let us therefore research the body, leave the mind out. Next one. So the, as they say, the divorce was quick. Divorce is always quick, isn't it? So divorce is quick. Then the reunion takes lot of time. So as you can see, it has taken nearly a century, you know, to reunite the mind body again. These are some of the milestones. Autonomic nervous system response to stress. Walter Cannon, famous physiologist, psychosomatic medicine, Franz Alexander, exactly 100 years ago. Concept of psychosomatic medicine. Then immune alterations happen in psychotic, so people, those who have psychotic disorder, their immunity is also disturbed. This was also detected 75 years ago when India was achieved independence. Then this famous, I think you all know this cortisol HPA, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, Hans Zeile, I am sure all of you know this. And later also came around the time I was born this idea about psychoimmunology. You know, that emotions can affect our immune system and vice versa. And then exactly 50 years ago, Benson, who was a cardiologist in the Harvard University, he came out with this idea called mind-body medicine, you know, that we need to somehow incorporate the psychological aspect and the medical interventions become better by that inclusion. And all these ideas further, you can say, consolidated psychoneuroimmunology and later, in the last 20 years, there has been a lot of research with regards to yoga and meditation and neuroplasticity. Next. Next, man. Next, next. It's a very interesting experiment. It was published in New England Journal of Medicine. They took in healthy people like us into a special facility. And they actually gave them, they inoculated them with virus drops, the viruses which cause common cold. And what did they find is that uh, everybody did not develop common cold. I mean the clinical common cold. Everybody had virus, but everybody did not develop the clinical common cold. Only those people developed clinical common cold who also had a high psychological stress. So it sort of proves the point that even for infections to happen, you know, there has to be a handshake, you know, between a psychology and the immunity. Next one. So the animal model of the same. This thing here that you see on the left side is a Vistar rat, a nice, very nice, beautiful red eye Vistar rat. If you put him in a prison, you know, this cage is a prison for this rat. If you put him into that, the immunity drops. You liberate the, you liberate the rat and the immunity bounces back. We all recently experienced during COVID times, what it means to be caged, the whole society experienced. Next. In parallel to the laboratory research, clinical research was also developing. You know, a lot of it actually courtesy cardiology. So people found all that, you know, negative emotions and coronary thrombosis, Type A behavior pattern, perhaps you might have read it in psychology, you know, that increased risk of cardiovascular disease. At 
then famously this relaxation response that stress response can actually be replaced by relaxation response and that's how you are able to help yourself and then more of such milestones you know later on now it is fairly well established that actually the depression is a single most indicator of mortality after heart attacks you know so it is fairly well established sort of a science now many meta analysis again professor google will tell you more i don't need to sort of run this list here for you depression anxiety anger hostility they are all risk factors for illnesses negative emotions important risk factors for illnesses and on the other hand the good news is that positivity positive psychological well being is a protector so in some sense you can say that if we have the ability if somehow we develop the ability we practice if we develop the ability to generate positive psychological well being we perhaps would be on a good track so this workshop therefore is also going to be a different one in the sense that instead of talking illness we are going to talk well being today wellness we are here to train ourselves into wellness okay with the hope that if we can train ourselves into wellness then possibly we can help our patients all to into wellness enough of illness you know we possibly need to also look at the more positive side of it next one very interesting recent discovery you all know amygdala amygdala everybody knows negative emotions inflammation adiposity very elegant study which found that people get obesity because of the high amygdala activity so if you are restless in your brain whatever amount of exercise you do or dieting you do you won't lose weight na there are a lot of people in this world who want to sort of lose weight but they don't lose weight the reason is not in eating excessive the reason is not because they are consuming more calories and spending less calories the reason is that they are not peaceful in their mind okay very interesting very elegant research you find many of now this kind of it is very common in many publications you can find these very elaborate links the messenger systems the even the entire molecular biology you know which inflammation genes and uh, which other regulatory genes get activated in the process of stress how they are linked how these pathways work next so based upon all this you can conclude that today we have a firm basis for this mind body connection good strong evidence scientific evidence technically it is called as pnie psycho neuro immune endocrinology okay so there have been various suggestions some some of our colleagues also jokingly say should we declare ourselves as you know pni expert what is what is your specialty i am a psycho neuro immune endocrinologist okay instead of calling <laughs> one self next one okay so let us play a video i will play a video for you you observe that video and you then you are going to tell me that what what did you understand you know from that video there will be lot of videos you know so you sit relaxed don't have to sit tight don't have to sit on the edge okay you relax this is not a test of iq it's not even a test of examination all these people have retired as examiners i can assure you they are not going to come in as your examiner <laughs> so please talk video okay. been written about boating but the one thing they never seem to mention is seasickness so if you're on the sloop john b you of course want to ride captain ride and the last thing you want to do is rock the boat baby now if you come sail away on your love boat you certainly don't need to be like the wreck of the edmund fitzgerald but now there's one innovation that could make it so you never want to be sitting on the dock of the bay here's ali ward to explain did anyone under the age of 50 get any of those references the water was this tranquil every time you went boating but that's not reality there's a reason of why don't rock the boat is an expression for upsetting things right this is a basic human experience that's uncomfortable and if you can solve that problem that's a big deal that's exciting i know 
avid boat lovers, Shepard McKenney and engineer John Adams set out together to solve the problem of boats rocking when the waves are rolling. What they created is a stabilizing gyroscope called Seakeeper, designed specifically for use on boats greater than 27 feet long. The relatively lightweight sphere is placed on or in a boat, and they say it can reduce boat roll by up to 95%. Can you see the difference here between one boat that has a gyro and the other that does not? In this is a clinical trial. One boat has a gyro, other is without gyro. Okay, see the result of the clinical trial. Okay. Next. Inside the sphere is a high strength steel flywheel, the motor that drives it, and the bearings that support it. Our fastest flywheel spins at 10,000 revolutions per minute. And all the air inside the sphere has been evacuated out. I met Shep and John at their factory in Moton to perhaps do some boating. Can you explain to me how does it work? What's going on inside? These four corners are mounted to the structure of the boat. And when this flywheel is spinning at a high rate of speed and the boat starts to roll, the flywheel senses that motion and it wants to tilt or process in a fore and aft direction. Oh, so okay. So if we were on a boat, the boat might be rocking this way and meanwhile, the gyro is going this way. That's right. It goes at 90 degrees to the direction it was disturbed. Their gyroscope combines a number of technologies to make an old idea viable today. You look at this thing and you say, it's just a spinning flywheel in a containment. It is such a technical task to get it to do what it does. The gyros are built and prepared for installation here in Pennsylvania. The most interesting part of this is these hydraulic cylinders, mm -hmm. and they are computer controlled to regulate that precession motion to keep it in phase with the rolling motions of the boat. The open water was calling, so we met up on their boat at a nearby lake to sample the technology. We started at the dock with human-made rocking. I'm no engineer, but I can tell that this is not very steady. <laughs> <laughs> so call it. Okay. Like. Engage, Gyro. No way. That is just bonkers. <laughs> Look at this, you guys are still going. You can't do it. Even though it was a calm lake, we tried to make some waves anyway. So we're gonna just make some waves. That's a complex answer involving physics and engineering, but that is nice. Wow. Some great songs have been written about boating, but the one thing they never seem to mention is seasickness. So. Yeah, yeah. Khade ho ke bolo. Mask nikal ke. Uska photo le. She is telling something very important. Most important statement I heard in a long time. Uh, uh, how uh, a stabilizer can actually improve the functioning of a system and make it more comfortable for the traveler. So it can be stabilized to our body as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. She deserves actually, I think, the whole box. Hmm? You say loud enough. Mic, are you mic? Mic, yeah. Mic, do. So now you say completely. You say completely. Don't give a Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so this shows how uh, stabilization is very important and it can uh, lead to more comfort of the traveler. So this can be symbolized to our mind and body where the stabilization of the mind can actually improve the stabilization of our life and make it easier for us to travel. Wonderful. So in this life, there is always a... Turbulence. Turbulence. Hmm? Turbulence is a part of boat ride. Okay, so we have to learn how to stabilize. Very nice. Manavali sir, aapke hath se yaar usko. Hmm? She deserves a bigger one. Hmm? So she got the absolutely hmm? the right uh, principle. Slide, slide, slide. Hmm? So. Hmm. Maagi sir, ek ek maagi sir, ek maagi sir. 
पीछे पीछे हाँ पीछे जा एक पीछे जा पीछे जाओ क्या और आगे पीछे पीछे हाँ पीछे जा हाँ नेक्स्ट अब नेक्स्ट हाँ एक्विस या सो दिस इज एक्जेक्टली व्हाट इट इज सो एस यू सो देर इज अ टर्बुलेंस टर्बुलेंस परटर्बेशन व्हाट एवर यू लाइक टू कॉल इट so the stabilization involves application of a counter force so there is a force which is trying to destabilize you apply some other force which stabilizes it counter force to the force causing turbulence so that there can be a smooth movement of the boat okay most important so the real world challenge is that there are forces external forces internal forces that is what today we are going to learn you know what are the external forces internal forces how they destabilize us and how we are going to stabilize ourselves okay do you think that nature has given sort of automatic gyros you believe you have automatic gyros which are those automatic gyros which nature has given us okay you think no problem there is no hurry to you know you have a whole day to respond that we we want to learn that you know we want to recognize the gyros which we may have and moreover we may want to bring in yeah go ahead go ahead i'm not too sure but it no it doesn't matter nobody is sure so <laughs> is it the flight fright freeze response so there can be like adaptive and maladaptive Yes. To uh, like stabilize yourself. Yes. So, so in a biochemical term, you can say that HP axis is one of the mm -hmm. gyros. Mm -hmm. HP axis is one of the gyros. The moment body senses that there is a turbulence, it engages. You know that gyro. Mm -hmm. Chalo, acha. I think as you will warm up, you will start recollecting more. You know more gyros. But another good idea is also to whether we could develop. You know, in addition to these automatic gyros, whether we could actually also develop that. I think we will pause here. we will have the actually the inauguration and uh, then we will we, we already have warmed up i think everybody has caught the basic idea turbulence is a part of life we have to stabilize through that and that is what the whole mind body health is about that is what the whole resilience is about okay so throughout the day today that we are going to do the exercise how we can sort of pick that up how we can regulate it better okay so let us proceed welcome madam we just i think will proceed you know with the inauguration is most welcome yeah shivram sir as uh, dr parke has explained this is the just introductory session and now we will have the uh, formal inauguration uh, dr patima murthy the director of nimans has joined us and so we are going ahead with the inauguration dr parke has already welcomed all of you but to formally say that this is a pilot kind of a project for psychiatry residents in india so you should all be happy to be part of the first uh, you can call yourself guinea pig if you want but then you know it also leads to something great it doesn't matter if we call ourselves uh, guinea pig as long as the end result is <laughs> so this is a pilot which we want to extend to not only psychiatry but all other medical specialties that is the whole idea that we are talking about and the indian psychiatric society has been backing us to the hilt in this and we have had workshops with the endocrinological society of india shortly we are going to have one gastro society of india so other medical specialties actually in some ways have been more perceptive of this problem of illness and wellness we were discussing in the morning a typical example given by dr vaishali deshmukh who is one of the leading endocrinologists in india she said a patient with thyroid comes to me i tell her your tsh is normal you don't you are not my patient anymore but the patient says sir madam i am not well i don't feel like i was before this thyroid problem came and she says i don't know what to tell that person according to my report she is well tsh is perfectly normal it has been so for last one year but she is not well i have no answer that is why they are looking for answers and they collaborated with the ips we had the 
I think already two are over now, sir. The two, sem two conferences, joint conferences are over. So this is, the whole of medicine is going to look forward to this, what we are talking about today. And in that context, we are very happy to have here stalwarts from the Indian Psychiatric Society, Dr. N. N. Raju. I welcome you, sir, on behalf of NIMHANS. Uh, Dr. Gangadhar, of course, uh, we were happy to see the small clip of Dr. Gangadhar receiving the Padma Shri in the beginning today. So he has been our uh, inspiration for the last maybe 20 years, beginning with schizophrenia, ECT, and uh, you know, introspectively he has looked at his life and now he has looked at yoga. So we are happy to have him, sir, uh, in spite of his busy schedule. In fact, at the same time, there is an East Zone conference going on. Dr. Raju should have been there as the president-elect of the IPS, but he has chosen to come here because he believes strongly in this idea and he will, uh, when he is president, hopefully he will be able to take forward this agenda. Similarly, Dr. Arun Marwale, who has become the president of the West Zone Psychiatric Association, is also keen to make that as the theme of his presidency. So these are the people who are really interested. Uh, this is not just a inauguration that they want to attend as part of their office, but it is that they are really interested. Dr. Pratima, of course, we had a long discussion with Madam yesterday, uh, extending to what actually we should be talking about in mind-body medicine. And so we are very happy to have you, Madam. Welcome. I would now ask all the dignitaries to please uh, light the lamp and begin the program formally. Light the lamp. Given that this program is not a very formal function, we have chosen not to have a great deal of formality. We would like it to be uh, quite informal. So, without any further ado, I would like to go ahead and ask Professor Gangadhar, I don't need to introduce him to this audience after you saw the video clip, to give us his ideas. Before that, on behalf of the Indian Psychiatric Society, we have the elect president-elect here, they would like to felicitate Dr. Gangadhar. Dr. I request Dr. Raju to felicitate him on behalf of us and the Indian Psychiatric Society. So, Dr. Gangadhar has strictly told us no Mysore peta, so we are not putting any Mysore peta. <laughs> he can open a shop of Mysore petas. Coming all the way here, uh, I think you have the opportunity to inaugurate two yeah, conferences. By all the way from here, I am now not in Bangalore. Yeah, he is the president of the Medical Assessment and Rating Board in the National Medical Council. 
so he is in Delhi otherwise, but he has come for the inauguration of one more national conference of neurology which is going on in Clark's Exotica. So we were happy to have him here. So I request Dr. Gangadhar now to go ahead and give us his brief idea about what he thinks mind-body medicine is. Standing is better. It's not a very uh, comfortable way anyway. The topic of mind-body medicine, resilience, has clearly uh, been an attraction in mental health. This, uh, the testimony to it is that we have some real stalwarts in psychiatry, both in terms of their academic brilliance and administrative stature in mental health. They are here for this inauguration in spite of many other constraints that they had. So it shows that psychiatry learning has given a lot of emphasis on mind-body medicine. We have Dr. Inan Raju, President-elect of the Indian Psychiatric Society, as an All India officer who heads the Indian Psychiatric Society, which is going to take over in another couple of months. January is going to be the president himself. Uh, he has thought it was very important that this program be inaugurated, although he had another two other programs that are going on right now today, the inauguration is going on. And we have the president of the West Zone Psychiatric Society, uh, Dr. Marwale, who is also here uh, to be here for this inauguration. And of course, the director of Nimhans, both by virtue of being the director of Nimhans and being also psychiatrist by profession. Uh, has been in this uh, function at the inauguration. All put together, it's uh, very clear that uh, this concept has attracted uh, as far as the training of psychiatry people are concerned. And of course, the mind-body medicine has become a part of the Indian Psychiatric Society, one of the chapters of the Indian Psychiatric Society. And Dr. Uh, uh, Sanjay Padke is the chair of this and he is going to be looking after this. And most importantly, the PG education chair, Dr. Henel Shah, will also be in this function. She is going to be joining us. So, it is clearly, uh, although this is a workshop where maybe 30, 40, 50 of you are here, but the importance that the uh, Indian psychiatry profession has uh, given to this in terms of you learning this con concept. Uh, uh, I think I want you to register in your mind and uh, I must congratulate each one of you for having made it to this very first workshop that has been uh, planned in this subject and in particular uh, in this chapter as part of the Indian Psychiatric Society's activity. So I congratulate you for uh, taking it up. And I congratulate each one of you for having made it to this program. The schism between mind and body perhaps was never there. For various reasons, maybe it was introduced in between. When I am saying it was never there, uh, I cannot help mention an Ayurvedic shloka, uh, Dr. Kishore, who is the professor of Ayurveda, who is here, uh, and we, of course, are sitting in an Ayurveda center, and uh, uh, we can't help saying, uh, taking note of the fact that health, when it is defined in Ayurveda, maybe a couple of millennia ago, also included mind and body. Namaste, madam. I just mentioned you being participative. 
So, so it uh, clearly said, uh, in addition to correcting my dosha, samadosha, samagnishta, samadatu malakriya, my body, and it also says, prasanna atmendriya manaha. In addition to manas, the spiritual health of me is also very important. So they are all very connected when you say that is called as swasthya. Swasthya iti abhidhiyate. So we always recognize that these were together. And in fact, whenever any psychiatric symptom is expressed, uh, the physical symptoms are mentioned first. In fact, uh, the very typical example that I have heard, and of course I am going to repeat, is that uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna starts explaining his uh, nervousness, uh, his concerns, his uh, worries, his sadness about all this is going to happen. The very first shloka in that, of course, in addition to all the preamble about the Bhagavad Gita itself, this in his description, his first symptom is, he starts with, Siddhanti Mamagatrani Mukancha Parishashyati. I am feeling very weak, I am feeling uh, about to drop down, I have got tremors and this bow is getting out of my hand. And then he goes on to say why this is happening and this is because of my worries. I am worried that somebody is going to be killed, etc., etc. But the first symptom he talks about is those physical symptoms. So it's clearly that we never saw these were different from in the past. But for some reason, like he was saying, uh, we separated out and we went on and on and on. And uh, maybe we have moved away even from the body. We have moved closer to a laboratory report, as Dr. Shuram was saying, that uh, you go to the uh, specialist, yeah, everything is fine, sir, you can go. Uh, there was one very typical example of a person who went through a cataract surgery. Uh, he went and then go to room number one, room number two, some test was done here, room number two, some other test, three, four, five. At the end of it, he went in front of the uh, ophthalmologist who was going to operate him for the cataract surgery. So he said, yes, yes, all is fixed, come out tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, you come. So I didn't even ask him what was the issue, etc., etc., because many people had tested anyway. So this man had to say the senior boy. The next day, by the time he went, the masks on the doctor's face was there. He didn't know who had told him to come at 9 o'clock, who was going to operate. Because eight other people had seen me and somebody operated. Of course, he operated, put the icing and then sent him back. The next day morning, he comes and the so-called ophthalmologist who had operated him was to see all these fellows. He puts his uh, uh, um, uh, the so-called plaster out, puts the torch and then he says, you are fine, you can go. So this man has never been asked, how are you? What is your problem? So this man got very irritated and of course it is a different story. I should be saying whether I am fine or not and you are not to be saying whether I am fine or not. So this argument went on. So somewhere in the course of our medical training, uh, perhaps psychiatrists are, perhaps were not uh, doing this, but over time maybe psychiatrists may also be doing it is that we may not be asking about how this person actually is experiencing, uh, how he is actually is, uh, we only ask for the symptom, we don't ask for how he is. Uh, so this shift has happened and this is something that I think we should consciously be aware uh, and it is no wonder all along uh, the hospitals were called as health centers, primary health centers. Now, it is not just being healthy, it has to be feeling well. So, they now use the term wellness centers. Almost uh, 1.8 lakh wellness centers are going to be established as part of the Ayushman Bharat mission. So, the concept has moved from illness, and again, not just being healthy, to being well. That is actually, I am feeling well. So this is uh, an important change that has happened even in the health administration as well, which is something that I think all of us have to notice. 
psychiatry also from merely how we can use uh, ketamine clinics uh, to ECT, which I was also talking about. We have moved to talking about mind-body medicine and why we need to pay attention to that person. In, a, in effect, in effect, the for F a, 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 a form of making the individual who is seeking help also be responsible for his health, number one. And secondly, recognizing that there is more strength in him to get better than in my own medicine or an ECT or a TMS or surgery or whatever it is. Yes, I do it. Yes, I do it. Of course, this is the skill that has been uh, told to me to learn. I learned in MBBS. Uh, I went on to do it in my MD, whichever may be the speciality. And this is the skill I apply. But this perhaps has, is a component, but a substantial component of feeling well and getting well uh, is in the individual. Although a lot of times we keep saying, a lot of times we keep saying that where there is a will, there is a way. But somehow that has somehow become just a colloquial statement, but not necessarily in terms of translation into effect. Where there is a will, there is a way. Do you have the will? And then there is going to be a way. And in fact, entire Bhagavad Gita, when they talk about, is talked about not so much to improve the skill, because Arjuna already had the skill, and that was not a start. What Lord gave was that will. And in fact, all the skill this man had acquired in the last uh, 20, 30 years, I don't know what was his age at that time, archery, the bows, various uh, weapons, blah, blah, blah. All that became a failure at that moment and that will changing by the Lord made a lot of difference. And that was uh, uh, converted into the victory over the uh, uh, wrongs from the right. That's a different issue. That is a story apart. But the f message is that will is very important and that will is in that individual. That will is not in me. I have the skill, but that man has the will. And that is never recognized. And most of the time, it is this uh, we have paid emphasis. And this mind-body medicine, not just for psychiatry, although it's psychiatry is quite important that we're going to be using it, I believe, having now uh, for the last one year working in the Medical Council of India, now called the National Medical Commission, uh, where medical education, the perspective has been slowly changing. In fact, in 2019-20, the Medical Council of India then introduced a module called as the ATCOM module. If some of you have go through the website of the National Medical Com uh, Commission, where it talks about communication, attitudes, empathy, and many of those things become very, very important uh, in terms of any one of us becoming a comprehensive, a complete physician. And when I am saying physician, I am, I am also, of course, including psychiatrists, it's not excluded. A good doc doctor skills uh, include many other components, which I think we are all going to learn over the course of time. And this emphasis has now come from many angles. The health administration, the health regulatory body, and many psychiatric or other educational bodies are also recognizing the whole thing. Just two days ago, there was an inauguration of the uh, Indian Academy of Neurology. I met a very, very senior neurologist I, uh, who uh, was placed in Delhi, but he participated in this uh, conference. He was saying, uh, super specialists, sir, I think we should uh, train them to be good communicators. Their skill is always there, but are they able to communicate and be able to make this person who is coming to treatment feel well, uh, in addition to, of course, giving a medicine, anti-epileptic or whatever it is. This communication skills is something that you need to impart to our doctors. So the entire concept is how to strengthen the will of that individual in which many of our components, our behavior plays into account, plays very important role. Uh, a, a quick search, if you go through any of the uh, indexes, if you look for what are the attributes of a doctor, 
what are the attributes of the doctor? The first one that emerges amongst the top 12 attributes, only one is mentioned as the medical knowledge. But all other 11 attributes are to do with uh, being compassionate, uh, uh, being a good communicator, being a good leader. All these components actually, in a way, indirectly, increase that will in that individual, increases the confidence in the individual in the treatment that this fellow is going to be getting from this doctor, increases the faith in that person into the doctor, which in turn increases his will. So many of the components, as good family physicians, they have these components. A family physician may not be as learned in maybe any given speciality in which our specialists, all of us have been trained in. But he is a very successful doctor because he increases that will in the patient, increases that component of the patient's uh, 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 mind which actually improves his body in a way. So medicines, of course, there is no two opinions. That's what we have learned. That is the foundation. But most important is we having to recognize the strength in that individual which has to be used, harnessed for my medicines to get better. Uh, there used to be a psychiatrist. Of course, he is still into a lot of bioethics, etc., etc. And he has done a small study. Uh, it's a small study, though, uh, which he uh, keeps talking about it whenever I meet him. Uh, he says, uh, I have used prayer as a method for them to get better. I give them medicine, I give them an antipsychotic or an antidepressant or an anxiolytic or whatever medicines I give. I tell them that you keep it, how do you remember to take it? You keep it near the place where you may pray every day or you make it a practice to do that. Uh, of course, he being a Christian, he used to say under that uh, cross you keep it. When you are taking, you say that it is the, uh, it's a prasadam that uh, the Lord is given and you take it. Although I am giving the medicine, but you keep it in that spirit. I, he has found that many people got this benefit. You may call it placebo effect because we have been trained in that science of placebo. Whether you want to call it placebo effect, you are going to have faith effect. But there are components in that given individual which have been harnessed. If a people, if a person has uh, faith in such things that adds to the strength in his will. So in effect, the entire mind-body medicine, what we are going to be talking about, is not merely a psychosomatic medicine in lectures that they are going to be talking about. I think it's, it's something much beyond that psychosomatic medicine and I am sure psychosomatic medicine is a peripheral component of the entire agenda we are talking of. But what is essential is that we realize, we have to realize recognize, acknowledge and use in terms of our translation in clinical practice that the individual whom you are treating has substantial strength in getting well from what illness that he has got and how I can harness. That skill also has to be learned by all of us, including myself. I've been taught right from the day one, I'm a medical model, that's the reason why I went on to research largely an ECT to begin with, almost half of my psychiatric career I was involved in that. But not that, I am not giving any negative connotation to the whole thing, but then the components of uh, uh, making this wellness agenda come up in the individual is something that all of you can do in addition to of course being good psychiatrists, learning good medical model of psychiatry which is important. This is equally important and that is something that we may have overlooked for several years in our training and I am sure the attention to that is now being given. I must say uh, heartfelt thanks to Dr. Raju. I wish him all the best in the coming year when he is going to be the president of the Indian Psychiatric Society to emphasize this component of learning in our psychiatric uh, residency and psychiatric training and early carrier people, which of course uh, Dr. Pratima has been doing a lot of this early carrier uh, uh, education uh, in terms of how psychiatrists can be just more than academic psychiatrists, can be more than 
uh, uh, this so-called the science what we learn in the physical method but then there are a lot of other components leadership etc etc which we can build in which will translate into the benefits that the patient will get so we have such people and that leadership having been given and i'm sure this what might have been missing when i say complementary medicine it is not another medicine that i'm going to use along with my uh, acetylopram to complement this person's outcome the complementary components of our learning uh, can be added into psychiatric practice which can make uh, psychiatric care much more holistic and even more useful to the patient i must congratulate each one of you who have made this possible for having made it to this uh, workshop learning and uh, i also thank our guest uh, faculty who have come all the way to address all of you and make sure that this workshop becomes a success wish you all the best have a good learning in this uh, workshop i thank again uh, the chairman of this uh, chapter inviting me to come over and uh, share a few points with you thank you very much thank you very much sir you know you all know why he has been an inspiration to us uh, doctor we are also happy to welcome dr hinal shah the chair of the pg committee of the indian psychiatric society she has come directly from the airport so she was with exactly in time so now i take this opportunity to ask uh, professor nn raju to give us his ideas on what he considers as important for the indian psychiatrists as a whole to take forward in the next one year thank you sir thank you uh, dr shivrama dr pratima murthy dr gangadhar dr hanal shah dr mawale dr sanjay fatke and my young friends in the audience i don't see anybody older than me there uh, uh, i'm really happy to be here in fact um, as dr gangadhar said i have other responsibility of uh, in fact being the chief guest in another function somewhere in northeast Uh, but uh, having uh, been uh, a witness to the developments and uh, the progress which uh, dr sanjay fatke has been doing over the years which he has been discussing with me and uh, with the help of uh, dr shivram and dr hanel and all i thought it is very important for me to be here because this is one concept which indian psychiatric society should carry forward and i am sure with the help of stalwarts which we have on the dais dr pratima murthy and dr gangadhar i think we should make big headway in future why it is important because basically we thought that the integration of mind into body is imminent there is no other way there is no other alternative for us so there has been some amount of schism some amount of uh, division over the years as dr gangadhar has been saying from illness perhaps we are moving towards health and then now to uh, wellness earlier um, saying i think uh, jokingly we used to say that how are you but now we say that you are fine how am i so this type of uh, uh, discussion has been going on so basically the wellness integrating it into other branch of medicine which we have been discussing with dr sanjay and dr shivrama too yesterday evening how best we can integrate not only with the body you know i think other branches of body like i think it is high time that uh, psychiatry go out of these boundaries and reach to other areas like other branches and bring out something and i am sure this uh, 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 task force which has been doing extremely well in fact i have as i said doctor i found dr sanjay fatke working with lot of uh, dedication and enthusiasm and also to integrate with other branches of medicine as i said i think other uh, societies too are interested be it endocrinological society be it dermatological society be it uh, diabetic dietologists so we should i think uh, we are having some road map to reach out to them and bring out some sort of documents i think and also we should have some work plan instead of just saying even though these statements are good to listen not very easy to implement 
like as i said wellness i'm not well as uh, dr shivarama said a thyroid showing tsh is this t3 is that t4 is this is far easier than making the person feel that i am well mind you uh, more especially in uh, uh, persons who attend to our clinics i think making the individuals stating that i am well the relative say that the boy is good the husband says my wife is doing well in fact in uh, depression we say that subjective wellness well being will be the last one to achieve the objectively they may appear good the i mean the spectators the onlookers might say that she or he recovered absolutely well but you ask the individual himself mm, not fully well so how best i think how to quantify that how best we can carry this message forward because this is not only important to the other branches of the body it might be important for other people in the society if we can do something like this perhaps we can uh, i think carry this to other pub, i think sections of the public be it uh, administrators be it uh, army people be it police be it ex- everywhere i think every human be like i think we can one day we can have something like an executive checkups maybe we will have a well being checkup sorry wellness checkups or wellness those things so perhaps i'm sure these are the seeds which we are sowing now perhaps in future in days to come uh, perhaps we can have a historical document to quantify this and which we can convince the people it is not i think dr shivarama is convinced dr sanjay fatke is convinced dr gangadhar is convinced they made me convinced but we may have to make others too get convinced that this is what we are here i think we have to sell this product then only we will reach and i'm sure anger generation with anger brains like you ours has uh, already dr uh, uh, sanjay has already i think declared as out saying that we are not active examiners any longer the anger brains are there in the audience who would be helping us in i think helping indian psychiatric society this is where we would like to rope in we can i think extend this concepts to different state branches different zonal branches and have a workshop in each of the conferences and so that is reaching reaching the people and reaching the public would be far easier of course uh, we have that stamp of nimhans uh, the i think quality of uh, nimhans getting integrated into indian psychiatric society would be a good uh, example of how best we can go about so i'm sure uh, this is what we are all looking forward to integrating psychological uh, uh, sciences into other sciences integrating psych- mental health into the other health indices and also integrating everything into one a uh, concept as uh, dr gangadhar was telling me in the morning instead of treating a lab test instead of treating a increased i mean urea levels perhaps i think there should be some teaching to treat the human as a whole earlier we used to have a holistic medicine or whatever name you give it so from then we went on to have a biopsychosocial model then we had to medical model coming back to again perhaps the brain model so whatever it is finally we need to have create a concept where we treat as a whole and we treat as an individual and finally we deliver that so hopefully i think um, uh, indian psychiatric society will do whatever best it can do we can assure you from our side that uh, all the possible uh, um, uh, i mean uh, work which can be done from our side would be done and again perhaps uh, dr hanel shah as the chairman of the training pg training and all perhaps uh, she would be uh, will be very happy if she can bring out some a document so that we can approach we have any again another man who can make an influence dr gangadhar in the nmc who can i think integrate that into our training too so how best we can do it again i think we should have a document which could convince him and you who who in turn can convince other members so that is how we should work on and i am how sure under the chairmanship of dr uh, uh, sanjay fatke and also we have another senior man dr arun marwale with a rich experience of being a academician and a professor in from Aurangabad so i think we will have something and hopefully this my presence here uh, uh, even though the la- last little bit of pleasure of 
visiting northeast but bangalore is such an attractive place and nemans is a place where we would like to come back again again and again i see lot of changes in nemans where i was here about 40 years back 35 years back and a lot of new buildings have come up new guest house i have stayed in so i thank uh, the entire nemans administration for giving that hospitality to me and once again i thank you and uh, i'm there at uh, whatever little i can uh, do i will be more than happy to be involved in once again i thank dr shivarama dr sanjay fatke and the entire administration nemans for organizing this conference and uh, i thank you once again and uh, i'm looking forward to uh, a good deliberations thank you very much thank you sir thank you sir for making the time and giving us this important uh, message uh, now i would request uh, the president of today's inauguration dr pratima murthy uh, to tell us what she thinks of this initiative thank you madam uh, thank you dr shivrama since you said it was okay to sit and talk yes. i will use that prerogative to make it as informal as possible uh, dr gangadhar dr raju dr marwali dr shah Dr. Farke, Dr. Shivrama, my colleagues in uh, the Department of Integrative Medicine, all of you young participants. Uh, the difference today is that one is not preaching to the converted. I hope, because I'm sure, and I hope that there is a lot of skepticism amongst you, questioning what this workshop is all about. what these concepts are all about because i think that right of initiation is very very important for you to be convinced that this kind of integration is very important for your patients and for yourselves all of us possibly took about 3 to 4 decades to reach here you have the advantage of reaching here within the first decade of your training and your career so in that sense this opportunity has presented to you very early so i think it's an enormous opportunity to really understand examine question as i said and then try and see what are the applications of what you have learned in your practice you are also in a place where this began where this whole idea began way back in the 1930s when this institution was set up and subsequently in 1954 when the all india institute of mental health was set up one of the pioneers there professor govind swami said exactly what dr gangadhar and dr raju said that the patient is not just a test tube where you you know carry out certain tests and read out certain values but the personhood of the individual must be recognized so this concept of looking at the patient as a whole or the person as a whole is a very ancient concept and dr govind swami tried to bring it into practice and that is why the whole idea of having a multidisciplinary team which looks at the mind in disease and in health from a variety of angles is very important at it was also around that time of course i mean it's it's very interesting the two streams that have occurred almost in parallel and at times they have intersected at times they have diverged all of you know that in the early 1900s there was a great interest in the organic understanding of mental illness you know we know that malaria therapy came up we know that insulin coma therapy came up so that was an important understanding but at the same time you had a parallel kind of stream which looked at the mind the unconscious and you know psychoanalysis as a practice you also know that subsequently with the discovery of chlorpromazine finding you know the neurochemical disturbances and finding a drug to you know to kind of balance this became very exciting the 1980s was the decade of the brain a lot of research happened thinking that we would find the genes the the you know the specific areas of anatomical localization etc while there was a lot of exciting discovery the end of it the end of the decade of the brain started people to again become concerned about this kind of fission 
between a biological approach and a psychological and social approach to people. Yesterday I was in a seminar where it was contended, are we training our postgraduates to become pill pushers? And that is something that again has been something of a dialogue or a discussion that's been going on. At NIMHANS, we have always focused on a multidisciplinary approach. That is why we have a team which consists not just of psychiatrists or doctors, but also psychologists, psychiatric social workers, nurses, and several other professionals who all work together. But despite that, the comprehensive understanding of the mind in disease and in health is not something we have applied ourselves adequately to. That reminds me of a young colleague who actually trained in Goa. Is there any of you from Goa? No? Okay. So this colleague who trained in Goa also spent some time here. Uh, his name is Param. And then, of course, he's been working in the U.S. He's doing his uh, dissertation. He's doing his doctorate. He was always very interested in spirituality as an approach. Uh, Sir was mentioning about that example. He, st he worked with chaplains in the United States. He worked with people in Indonesia, the medical doctor, medical trainees in Indonesia and in India, and discovered that people who were open to integrating, you know, these kind of psychological principles, these kind of spiritual principles in their practice were more empathetic, could communicate better with patients, patients' rapport and trust was greater in the, in the whole person. Yesterday on a WhatsApp group, there was a doctor who was saying, I have asked this patient of mine with this depression to go and consult somebody else, but they have such implicit faith in me that they don't want to leave me, they want to consult only me. Therefore, I am talking to all of you to kind of help me to deal with this patient. So, when a patient develops a therapeutic rapport with you, you know that you can retain the patient and follow up and the patient is likely to do better. What are the ingredients of maintaining this therapeutic alliance, of understanding the patient and helping the patient through both in disease as well as after recovery is really something that all of us as doctors need to know the ingredients of. We've demonstrated that if you retain people in therapy or in treatment, their long-term outcomes are better. And how do you retain people? Even if it is to make sure that they take their medicines, the approach is through understanding the individual. And that is why general practitioners in India have been so successful. They not only, know the, they not only knew the patient, they knew the, fam the relatives of the patients. If there was an illness in the family, they knew about it. They would advise the person you know, about good living skills. And therefore, they would be able to retain you know, the person for a long period of time. And these were lifelong relationships that they had with their patients. Unfortunately, with the kind of skilling that we have developed, it is, which is predominantly knowledge-based, we perhaps have lost this ability to engage with our patients and maintain these therapeutic relationships which are very, very important in the long run. So therefore, we must shift from this conveyor belt approach. You know, and increased specialization, I think, has that problem. I remember one in, when you were talking, so I remember this was a famous actress whose mother went to one of the very leading hospitals in the United States and had to have a, you know, lob a lobectomy actually uh, for, a, you know, for a neurosurgical operation. The whole thing was so kind of divided that she ended up having the wrong side of her brain removed. And can you imagine? And somewhere along the line, perhaps if those questions had been asked, if people had been engaged, I'm not saying these problems could have entirely been obviated, but at least the, the, you know, the kind of response of our health systems could have been much better. Now, one of the reasons for the interest in what are called complementary or alternative medicines in the, in the United States has stemmed out of the opioid epidemic. And in fact, 
uh, about a decade or two ago, one of the leading medical journals, they decided consciously that 20% of their public publication research journal, the journal would be dedicated to publishing uh, in articles on complementary medicine. Because I think this kind of a very focused, myopic understanding of people is not enough. And therefore now, uh, you know, it's very ironic that a country which started this whole, you know, the, which actually developed the concepts of Ayurveda and yoga, have actually, re the interest has been rekindled because of this kind of global interest in the area of alternative medicine or complementary medicine or call it what you will. We also know, we moved away now, we know that there is an interaction between the genes and the environment. Now you can argue whether it's a 50, 50, 60, 40, 40, 60, I mean till the cows come home. But we know that the environment, both the internal environment as well as the environment externally can influence neurotransmission, can influence you know, various aspects of functioning of our brain and the stimulation of various aspects of the brain. And therefore, this constant interaction is something that we need to understand and apply to our understanding of illness and disease. We know that, and this is what we were discussing yesterday, that pe people with serious mental illness are also have innate capacities which are never explored. Somehow it is confined to the treatment of their symptoms and not towards increasing the potential of the individual. Finally, what I want to mention to all of you, Dr. Gangadhar mentioned that for you know, a few decades now, I've been involved in the training of young postgraduates. Dr. Farke and I were recalling that we were in the first training of these young mental health professionals with Dr. Norman Sartorius. Which year was that? 94. And now that journey is something that has continued. So for those of you who look for lifelong mentorship, this is an example of how we have continued to be mentored and mentor our younger colleagues in understanding people as a whole, in developing good skills as doctors, as leaders in your profession. And that cannot come out of knowledge alone. You need to build the skills of communication, of empathy, of compassion, you also need to demonstrate, and that is something for all of us, to be able to demonstrate that not just these, now whether it is yoga, which is something that is of great interest to everybody here, I know, I believe Dr. Raju also had initially pursued an academic interest in the whole area. We were talking about the Bhagavad Gita, which talks about the various karmas that you need to engage in. And in some ways, we are also doing our karma by doing our, you know, um, you know, karma yoga in terms of the dedication to our own fields. How do you integrate all of this into a holistic understanding, not just of patients, but ourselves? So that, I'm, one of the things that we are all concerned about is young professionals who come to us for training, many of them have poor adjustment, have a lot of psychological distress, do not know how to cope, do not know how to be resilient in the face of adversity. And we were discussing that a good state of equanimity is not the absence of stress. It is the ability to deal with either very positive kind of situations or indeed very negative situations, learn how to cope with it and learn how to move with it. And as doctors, we are also in these positions of stress, in these positions of you know, great disappointment. And we also need to learn to handle these. Uh, I remember one of my psychology friends who had this little thing, a little poster. She said, a therapist can never take the patient or the client beyond a situation where they themselves have not reached. So in some ways, and, you, and all of you remember when you did psychoanalysis, you had to train yourself in psychoanalysis. While you don't need to go there, I think understanding these principles is very important both for the care of our patients and for self-care. And finally, now the whole thing has shifted. The whole understanding is not to go to a doctor first, is for ourselves to deal with our own you know, distress, and learn coping mechanisms ourselves so that we can 
mutually support each other to be able to do that and then of course be able to help our patients. So what we're going to learn today, the science of some of the mind-body relationships, and there's a lot of interest in it, whether it is in terms of, you know, the mind in disease, in physical disease, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, or indeed the gut and the brain axis and the psychosomatic disorders, or simply looking at the positive mental health and looking at the potential for health and wellness centers where we can actually teach people not just asanas and pranayamas, but also good living skills. Unfortunately, life skills was something that the WHO talked about only in the concept of adolescence. But I think life skills are very important for all of us in the way we engage with each other. And unfortunately, I think it's the COVID which has taught us to look beyond just where am I going to go up in my career? Where, what was my material kind of understanding? To really understanding that as a society, even if we are, have to socially isolate ourselves, we need to remain socially connected to each other. And I think those, I think, are the underpinnings of learning how to integrate not just physical medicine, but also psychology, and therefore, develop an integrated approach to the understanding of the mind and the brain, which are not separate entities, but which need to work in complementarity to each other. So I hope at the end of this seminar, you will feel enlightened. It will help you all to understand yourselves and, of course, how to take this forward to your patients. I hope some of you will do research in this area because I think it's very important to have enough empirical research to take these ideas forward. Thank you very much for asking me to speak. Thank you. I think each of you have spoken as a faculty of this rather than as a guest for the inauguration uh, from your heart. Thank you very much. We would now like to take uh, this opportunity to ask Dr. Raju, Dr. Pratima, Dr. Hinal, Dr. Marwale and Dr. Gangathar to release the current edition of the Samatvam uh, newsletter. This is a quarterly newsletter put out by the Integrative Department at Manhans. And this time it's on a topic which most of us are worried about, the mental health of the elderly during COVID-19. Of course, on this side of the stage, we might be more towards that age group, but all of you would see patients of that age group. So uh, this has been uh, brought out by the Demands Publication yes. Division. Yes, sir. Yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. All of you will get a copy, so don't worry. Now, I request Dr. Fadke, please sit down, madam. Uh, I request Dr. Fadke to give the concluding remarks uh, of the inauguration proper. On? Ah. Thank you, Professor Shivram. I like to, instead of a vote of thanks, I actually like to propose a vote of gratitude you know, to these people. And I am really thankful, you know, to his wisdom to organize actually the recording of this. You know, perhaps three people, what you spoke, is going to, you know, become a very impactful uh, sort of a speeches, three most impactful speeches, I think, you know, in the history of psychiatry and uh, in the new beginning of this health activity. So I am personally very obliged, very thankful, no words to, I mean, you know, express my Gratitude to these people. I was personally very pleased, you know, a couple of days back when uh, Professor Gangadhar sir, when he was there in the Ashoka Hall, I told my son, I sent him your clip, sir, and I told him that uh, my sir has received the Padma Shri. He also sent me a clip, you know, by another professor of physics who has written a very famous book and uh, all the boys and girls, you know, bright boys and girls read the physics books and he also received the Padma Shri. So I think that a society, you know, which has finally started recognizing its teachers and honoring them, you know, finding them in the Ashoka Hall is something, you know, for which I can be immensely thankful, you know, to the nation and uh, to the government, you know, immensely sort of wonderful. I sincerely hope, you know, and I look forward to 
seeing the other colleagues also you know in his company you know to soon be there anytime soon in ashoka hall so it's not just be gangadhar you know pratima madam raju sir we like to see more of you you know go there to with these kind of a great ideas and the great work department of integrative medicine colleagues you know they will be very active now with you people a very young lot very enthusiastic lot i am extremely thankful you know for them to organize this whole activity hinal madam traveled actually from mumbai just for uh, in fact i asked her that you know why not take a rest so she said i am a mumbai person i am a energetic person travel early early flight in the morning she goes back in the evening but just for this purpose she could be here and uh, your presence of course as gangadhar said is not only symbolically important you know but it sort of places a high emphasis which you know scheme of uh, in the scheme of things of these people so thank you so much hinal madam that you are here and uh, gangadhar sir pratima madam and raju sir and in fact yesterday we had a great um, uh, interaction with uh, pratima madam and uh, uh, she has assured her you know, i expressed my wish that maybe some time uh, we have a possibility to have a sort of brainstorming you know about kind of uh, these new concepts what the direction in which all these activities uh, could take and uh, uh, she is completely supportive of that and uh, some day soon you know we are going to steal her for one day from the man as i told her from the director's chair just to sort of a uh, participate in uh, this particular discussion pratima madam as she mentioned that uh, professor norman sartorius some of you some of whom you may be aware you know some of you may be aware of him professor norman sartorius a very influential figure you know he was the director of world health organization later the director of uh, world psychiatric uh, the president of world psychiatric association and he had these ideas you know that today's actually young people are tomorrow's leaders and with that hope you know and uh, he sort of i was also very lucky to be in that first batch and uh, you are the first you know person who now reaches a chair wherein you are in a position to further help uh, more of us so i think we have to keep it rolling some time back that is what shivram also told me you know that now it is time that to professor uh, sartorius and uh, professor ms valiathan you know who has also been our benefactor a uh, guide who has been guiding us well that it is time that we take that baton and try to you know now really run from where you know these people have brought us to a certain level we should try to kind of uh, uh, take it over from them it is time that we do that so i am very thankful to you professor raju responded professor raju and we were together you know in kind of a nimans as he said more than 3 decades ago you know so with all these people those who are here my relationships really go long long back you know really long long back more than 3 decades when i was a student here he was also actually doing his neurology here now first he came for a neurology posting then he was a neurology resident here and uh, it was wonderful that uh, he is here today you know he expressed his, his strong support to these ideas and in fact as part of his presidential agenda and so is professor marwale who has also been as i told you this morning you know three decades and uh, part of the initial disaster management activity so i am sure you know that uh, this whole thing no longer would be some kind of a fanciful idea of a handful but possibly would evolve into something very substantial which we are able to contribute not only to psychiatry but contribute to the overall field of medicine so that we are able to make uh, this substantial contribution i thank you all kind of uh, so much and uh, again it was a feeling of sir we had a great vicarious pleasure you know kind of uh, you can't imagine that standing you know seeing you standing there in that ashoka hall you know was such a so thank you for bringing you know that glory and that pride to psychiatry thank you so much we have to now I request you to felicitate uh, dr gangadhar and dr raj yeah. it's our honor sir thank you very much And Dr. Nen Raju, we will see you in Vizag, sir, taking over as the president of the IPS. I request Dr. Pratima to felicitate Hinal, Dr. Hinal Shah, who has taken all this trouble for one day. <laughs> yes, for the photo. 
I also request Dr. Pratima to felicitate Dr. Arun Murwale, who has been both a teacher and a student of Dr. Fadke. So, yes, sir. Oh, yes. I request Dr. Fadke to actually felicitate Kavita. Yes, sir. Who has been actually the working force behind this whole thing. Uh, we have been having dinners and lunches, but she has been actually doing the work. So I request all of you now to stand for the national anthem and then we will have a break of 10 minutes before we reconvene. Slide you can give us. Agay kya sab everybody in? Chalo go down. So the dignitaries have left, so you can be more relaxed now. Okay. And I stopped being a medical teacher long ago, so I am definitely not your examiner. So okay. So we will uh, resume. You know where we left, so that uh, we have bit of a running a bit late but we'll continue that so this is the point on which we were there I think so we talked about that there is a turbulence then there is a stabilization and then there are some mechanisms for stabilization which happen automatically like she started saying for example HP axis is one such mechanism that we know which gets engaged automatically as soon as it senses that there is a turbulence the HPA mechanism gets activated. So similarly, there are other mechanisms also which we'll discuss. But more important part is the later one, you know, written down there in yellow, voluntary regulation. What Gangadhar sir was calling as willful. My body will do it, but can I also, you know, initiate that willfully? Can I regulate, you know, my own system? So look at next. So we'll quickly actually run through this because we are more interested that you people do those uh, exercises, you know, to recognize this, what we are talking in theory. You know, in experience, you should recognize it. Yeah, so this light, I think, is a bit... Okay. Luckily, we have a very good description, you know, of this rhythm, the rhythm within us, the rhythm of life, how it is like. The book shown here is a mathematics book, you know, mathematicians who work on that, it, this whole field is called as a nonlinear dynamics, but the point is that it is possible to even quantitatively compute that, you know, whether our rhythm is in a natural state or not. But that is unimportant, you know, as Shivaram and Gangadhar sir said, because we are not important to read out, you know, some paper report that how is your rhythm, like a new lab report. We are more interested, how can I recognize 
you know, what way my rhythms inside my body are running, which are these rhythms and how they are running. Next. And these rhythms, as you know, are there, you know, because we have a rhythm in the nature. Day-night rhythm, weekly rhythm, seasonal rhythm, annual rhythm. What is there outside, in the outside world, must actually somehow get reflected inside. Now, we have to remain connected, you know, with the outside world. So, that's why these rhythms, you can say, is a reflection of the rhythm of the nature that is outside of us. Next. Next, next. Next, Kardayar. Now, please look at actually this diagram. This is a very important diagram in our scheme of discussion today. You all can see it, no? So, up till now, we mostly were talking about categorical approach to health. Did you ever hear this term? Categorical approach means two categories. Health and illness. And although WHO gave a very nice conceptual definition long back, but for all practical purposes, we still continue to operate on this dichotomy. Illness and health. Illness nahi hai toh, it is the assumption is that the person is healthy. A better way than that categorical approach is this dimension. So, this green one is a healthy system. Healthy means ordered. Ordered means ki jiski rhythms barabar chal rahi hai. Where all the rhythms are working in a nice way. That is a healthy system. A resilient system is even more healthy, which has a more capability, you know, so even if there is turbulence, there is stress, there is turbulence, that you are not getting disturbed by that. That is a resilient thing. Then the yellow one, technically it's called as an allostatic load. You may all be aware of a term called homeostasis. Homeostasis, first year medicine, everybody learns about homeostasis. Now this additional concept called allostasis. Allostasis means system is experiencing stress or load. So, what we call psychological stress and what is happening inside. You know, for example, the HP axis activation, autonomic nervous system activation. So, the system is experiencing a stress inside. That is what the allostatic load is. Then the next stage is the disease stage. So, when the person has now developed a, gone beyond the mere load, mere stress and has developed a, where there is a disorder, you know, now the rhythm is quite disturbed and then you have the Complications. Can somebody within this paradigm give me example of, say, depression? How would you, on this dimension, you know, put actually the normal mood of depression, the syndrome of depression, the disorder of depression, and the complications of depression? Can someone do that? Example of depression, common example, na? psychiatric or commonest example. Where would you play, place depressed mood? Only the mood. Only the mood. Only the mood. This will give you the possibility to actually put them. The allostatic uh, load, if we say only about the mood and not about the syndrome, somewhere orange and yellow is. Okay. So her opinion is, ah, so her opinion is that uh, that she would locate the low mood or the depressed mood in yellow or orange. Where where would you want to put it? Do normal people also have depressed mood? Yes, uh, we can put low mood in healthy state and ordered system as well. Okay. And. Uh, the um, further signs can be uh, in the uh, uh, allostatic load. Where, where, where will you put grief? There is a lot of discussion no, now about the classification. Where will you put the grief? Is it normal, abnormal? Where would you want to put it? Sorry? It could be anywhere on this dimension. This is the benefit of the dimension, you know, rather than fighting whether this person has an illness or whether this person is healthy, that you can place a person, you know, depending on... Okay, so when we say that this person now has a syndrome of depression, what are the two defining P's that we use? First P and the second P. In the, in the definition of syndrome of depression, now when you say that this person is depressed, 
डिप्रेस फॉर फ्यू मिनट्स डिप्रेस फॉर फ्यू आवर्स डिप्रेस परसिस्टेंटली सॉरी परसिस्टेंट परसिस्टेंट लोम। लोम। सो द पर्सन इज इन द रिदम ऑफ डिप्रेशन ऑल द टाइम डू यू नो दैट मूड ऑल्सो इन नॉर्मल पीपल फ्लक्चुएट्स वी ऑल एज नॉर्मल पीपल गो थ्रू पॉजिटिव इमोशनल स्टेट्स निगेटिव इमोशनल स्टेट्स इनफैक्ट द फ्लक्चुएशन ऑफ मूड स्टेट इज नॉर्मल रिदम द रिदम इज नॉर्मल सो वेन अ पर्सन गेट्स टक only in one emotional state na no? then we call it as a disorder so that's why that term persistent depression ab isko pehen lo okay okay persistent depression hmm? persistent means which is not changing all the time pervasive across all contexts all situations so irrespective of the time and the place that a person is all the time na so the person has lost the normal rhythm of the mood state okay mood disorder is actually is a classic example na of disturbance of rhythm okay we'll come on to that na so so the purpose over here is that we are saying that you can go from green to yellow from yellow to orange orange to red if you are not careful if you are careful if you want to initiate this self help then it is possible to come back also few years ago there was a book by a cardiologist called dean ornish pata hai kya kisi ko dean ornish naam suna hai kisne dean ornish हाँ तेरे को भी मिलेगा यार क्यों नहीं यार बता दे तू ही बता दे यार यू टेल दे यू टेल दे अबाउट डीन ऑर्निश डीन ऑर्निश सीरीज ऑफ स्टडीज इन आई मीन इज एक्सट्रीमली फेमस इन फैक्ट फॉर द वेस्टर्न वर्ल्ड इट इज व्हेन दे स्टार्टेड थिंकिंग ऑफ माइंड बॉडी मेडिसिन बिकॉज डीन ऑर्निश गेव ए वेरी पावरफुल सीरीज ऑफ एक्सपेरिमेंट विच शोड दैट अदर फैक्टर्स दैन मेडिसिन were actually responsible for the recovery of people who had heart attacks and not only that for people to get heart attacks the factors were most of the factors were what we call as now modifiable this concept of modifiable and non modifiable for the west started with dean arnish of course not that things were not there but he sort of put it forward so if the if you look at say for example oh thank you sir yeah. <laughs> i was joking if you look at harvard today uh, we take harvard as the epitome of western medical science for them any post graduate medical student has to go through a one week mind body medicine course it is mandatory uh, it is run by uh, darshan mehta and his group uh, a lot of people are there but they take their inspiration from two people one is dean arnish one is herbert benson Herbert Benson is more directly responsible for the Harvard mind body medicine movement and this name of course we have unfortunately like pratima said we had to borrow it from the west uh, because it has already become famous so dean arnish was the first in that he, if you put dean arnish you will get uh, i don't know maybe uh, 1 million references or whatever it is but he was the first cardiologist to say medicines do not solve heart problems or do not and moreover he is also credited for giving a wonderful label called as reversal of heart disease yes dean ornish is most famous for reversal of heart disease okay so dean ornish in fact demonstrated that that you know initially you have risk factors now say allostatic load one risk factor is for example smoking other risk factor could be for example depression you know so you have the risk factors and then you gradually slide down to get the heart disease but even the heart disease can be reversed you know and uh, that was actually in some way 20 30 years ago a great thing you know to first time demonstrate and this dimension therefore gives us hope you know that illnesses can happen but they can also be reversed okay that is the sort of a most important and that's why this contribution dean onish's contribution is considered as shivram said very important that if you do something the so called part of your lifestyle things then you have a possibility to and what does this whole so called lifestyle thing do the whole lifestyle thing 
evokes the positive things within us. So if the stress can evoke, for example, the HP axis or the negative part of the autonomic system or the negative part of the inflammation, there is something which these practices do to bring up some positive things, which sort of actually do the reversal part, okay? So this one is very important. Next one, we will quickly, we'll, next one, next one. And resilience is, of course, you know, as we said, is your ability to this pushback. So you try to, the illness tries to push you, certain adversities, they try to push you, and your ability to push back is actually the resilience. Next one. There is one interesting recent concept that people can even go one step better or higher than resilience also. So there could be some anti-fragile people also. Okay, so let us play this interesting video and watch, you know, as you watched actually the previous one and rightly recognized. Video, yeah. So surfing, wala. Video. Uh, video. Surfing. Session one, surfing. So what is the difference between that first video which you saw, no? that, that boat which is rocking, then you put that gyro and uh, then it sort of stabilizes. What did you pick up in this video? Anybody? Start talking. There they were trying to uh, go against that was happening, the pressure and counter the counter force and here it is mostly it was sailing with the flow with the difficulties and wonderful <laughs> wonderful yuram ji chalo yaar they have started inko <laughs> yes so this is another possibility very interesting possibility so one way to deal with cope with any stress or turbulence is to apply a counter force the other, even possibly a higher possibility is that you go with the, you get energy actually from the stress, you know. Stress giving you energy. It is these waves, you know, wild waves which is giving energy to this person to actually sail. You know? So he's riding actually the disturbance, okay. Which one would you like to be? What is your personal goal? Tell me now. You want to be the gyro man or you want to be the surf man? You set the goal for you, so that I will then tell you which one to do for what. <laughs> you have to have a goal, no? you have to, as Gangadhar sir said, you need to have the will. Nega. Skill, fine, skill we all can give you. You need to have the will. So what is your will? You want to ride the surf or you want to ride the boat? Hmm? So no penalty, you know, for higher goal. <laughs> Okay, with the flow, both. Yes. You're a smart person. Yeah, she wants a boat also. And surf also. <laughs> okay. Inka kya kena hai hoy in logo ka? What is your this one, yar? Boat or surf? 
Yeah, depending on the scenarios, one. <laughs> so we can. Yeah. So, uh, as I said, uh, we can come back from the stressor, or we can uh, get the energy from the stress and go ahead. Sometimes we have to stand with our own opinion alone that uh, where gyro, gyro force is uh, useful and sometimes we have to accept the situation and go with the Wonderful. So both, you are open to both. You, you already said. Yeah, but for the long term, I would like to be the surfer. You would like to be the surfer. So if the adversity has already set in, then the surfer would be better. Otherwise, I would go for the boat. So if the surf, you will accept that and you will accept the challenge. Uh, sir, I would like to go for the uh, choose surf uh, because here the control is, uh, uh, we have the control over that. Mm -hmm. In gyro, it is the machine which is taking over the control. So, we can... And then, sir, what did you say to the patient? Tell me about it. It's a big deal. He said that Sir, yesterday just evening was telling us, you know, last week he had a patient, that girl, was she was from IIM. Yeah. And uh, as usual, you know, mild to moderate depression she was in. So, Professor Raju first offered her a gyro, called his citalopram. He said, tu gyro le le. <laughs> Girl said, no, no, I want the surf. So, he said, okay, fine. So, then let us surf. 10 sessions, it takes time to learn surfing. Gyro is passive, easy. So there is a board, there is a gyro, you feel safe, no problem. Button Surfing, higher speed. You just had to press the button in the game. You just had to press the button. You saw in that video, na? engage gyro. Engage gyro and rest of it happens in a automatic way. Chalo, batao, jaldi jaldi batao. Sir, surfing. Surfing. Definitely surfing. Surfing. Sorry? According to situation. According to situation. Equipment have not one but hundreds of gyros. So surfing. He's actually surfing the net like that. Like Madam said, till the cows come home, we can keep discussing 40, 60, 70. Probably more gyros. According to today. Surfing. Both. Initially, maybe surf, but on the long run term, if you stress enough. <laughs> surf. surf when you are a resident and in your young age and then settle for the boat as you grow older. Good strategy. I like that. Surfing. Wonderful. So, it is quite clear that uh, you are not averse of surfing at least. Surfing aversion. You can have tomorrow this nice description of a person, your own self, the people around you, is he averse of surfing, you know? Is he averse of dreaming? Is he averse of surfing? Does he want gyro? Does he want boat with one gyro? Does he want boat with, you know, multiple gyros? Aeroplane has so many of them, you know, so. Good, so next. Now the disturbance can come technically from two external and Internal, nega. external disturbance, where does it come from? Actually, a Pratima Madam sab bol ke gai hai, nega. Inside, outside, huh? physical forces, environmental stressors, microbiota, including gut, nega, gut brain axis. We are going to do some actually experimentation also about that. So, now that you have assured me that you are all surfers, so I will not hesitate to do different experiments for you, okay? One of them is also a gut brain experiment, okay? Then, of course, you know, the psychological aspect. So, the physical world, the microbial world, and the psychological world, you know, our rule of three, simple to remember. In a disaster setting, all three are present. You know, there is a psychological, of course, shock. There is a physical force also to which people are exposed. 
and uh, the microbial like uh, covid may be you see all these disturbances happening hmm? offsetting mechanisms as we said they exist natural offsetting mechanisms you know to deal with these ones we will discuss them what they are because we have to recognize and apply them we have to recognize that which force is working and what i should apply counter force or should i go you know with the force and do whatever that i want but sometimes the balance is disturbed when the disturbance is either too much or whatever inappropriate next we'll discuss that what is that okay nature has this beautiful design called as cell similarity so therefore we need not remember too many things normally the rule of thumb is what is outside same will be inside okay if there is a disturbance outside there will be disturbance inside if something we can settle down outside something we can settle down inside so what is this called as is russian doll this is called as a russian doll so the doll they fit inside each other they are smaller but nonetheless they all have the same design which makes actually life very easy for us now because you master one russian doll and you master actually all the other russian dolls you know that is the beauty <laughs> chalo next inner disturbance what is the first inner disturbance although everything is fine in life but every moment we all are aging isn't it it's called as the arrow of time why is called as the arrow of time because it moves the arrow of health and illness can move in both directions barabar hai na arrow of health and illness can move in both directions but arrow of time moves in only one direction we as yet don't have the possibility you know to like it's only in movies that you can regress back to young people again <laughs> otherwise most ordinary human beings mortals like us we have a possibility only to grow older like not grow younger so even if everything is fine and peaceful in life we still have to deal with this process called aging and in a way you can say illness is nothing but actually accelerated aging you know in some sense we will discuss that also then the other inner disturbance is spontaneous brain activity which are all the organs in the body which are spontaneously active pacemaker let let them call pacemaker which all all the organs have the pacemaker heart of course next does brain also have a pacemaker is it activated by some external stimuli or is it active on its own all the time sorry external okay so you you favor the external theory no problem yes the the biological clock the yes, internal internal huh? circadian clock is an example that is what the mood disorder is about when the clock glows fast what we call us what is it called as when the clock becomes fast it is called mania when the clock becomes slow what is it called as simple na kya so so there is a spontaneous brain activity going on we are going to experience that and then there are cognitive and affective barriers conflicts habits biases different these terms we are sort of going to hear them in a kind of a while just last week you know mr aron beck what is he famous for what did he point out that cognitive errors like cognitive errors are there and uh, we need to deal with that is what the cognitive behavior therapy is about no so different kind of cognitive errors we are going to see them you know what those cognitive errors are do you think that we also have the cognitive errors in us or you think only patients have the cognitive errors we also have can we hallucinate under the right circumstances yes next okay what do you see here bolo yaar zor se bolo flow with the tur turbulence yes flow with the turbulence na okay next one 
what is this stagnant you got turbulent waters turbulent flow stagnant third one what is this streamline streamline okay you got now these three pictures in your mind like turbulent stagnant nice flow which psychiatric disorder has turbulence anxiety anxiety you can talk anything are all psychiatric <laughs> so i am going to tell you you know you could also look at psychiatric disorder from this point now that how is the brain flowing how is the mind flowing is it turbulent is it stagnant kaun se disorder mein stagnant ho jata hai okay or ha catatonia bolo na dusra naam bhi bolo yaar catatonia hmm catatonia okay there are hundred terms ne ka psychiatry mein officially बराबर है ना उसी पे काम करते हैं ना भरत वगैरह नहीं क्या कि वो क्रॉनिक स्केज ऑफ रेनिया में डिफॉल्ट स्टेट ही नहीं है स्टेगनेंट हो गया है इसको जरा कुछ करवाओ तो फिर इसका फ्लो चालू हो गुड और ओसीडी ओसीडी टर्बुलेंट अरे क्या है यार अच्छा है यार जनार्दन रेड्डी सर नहीं आया आज न्यूरोसिस का डेफिनेशन क्या होता है यार ओल्ड टाइम लोग वट इज न्यूरोसिस डेफिनेशन Insight is there. Yeah. <laughs> there is an insight. Ah, okay. Um. So the neurosis क्या होता है? What the whole idea? सुना है ना ये term सुना है ना आजकल रहते हैं ना psychiatry में ये term की neurosis नहीं क्या? What is neurosis? Explain me in simple, simple things. Non, non tech. Yeah. सुना है ना न्यूरोसिस सुना है ना बोला जो जो नहीं आएगा ना लिख लो पढ़ लेना जाके बाद में अच्छा रहता है ओके सो न्यूरोसिस इज अ टिपिकल एग्जाम्पल ऑफ गेटिंग स्टक वट इज वरिंग वरिंग क्या है यार वरिंग टर्बुलेंस है अदर पीपल वॉट इज द थिंग वॉट इज वरिंग वॉट इज ब्रूडिंग सुना है क्या ये ऐसे टर्म ब्रूडिंग क्या होता है वॉट इज ब्रूडिंग हाँ वॉट इज रूमिनेशन एंड ब्रूडिंग like a momentary think about a particular topic which which necessarily ends without uh, giving an anxiety or a stress good ye sabhi hai na abhi lunch mein google karke dekh lo sabhi neurosis kya hota hai brooding kya hota hai procrastination kya hota hai what is procrastination so different disturbances in the flow like in some or other form theek hai samajh gaya funda next let us go next what is this i will i will i will give you i will give you a hint for this if you can't recognize this i will give you a hint kya hai ye uh, storm huh? this was a it looks Sorry. like noah's ark Sorry, <laughs> 
So this idea of flow, nice flow, turbulence is not only part of one mythology because you thought that otherwise, you know, I showed you a river, I showed you a pond, I showed you a flowing river. This is from, as we know, from the Christian mythology. Kya dikha hai isme? What is the, since you know Noah's Ark, you can also tell you know, the mythology. Mythology is meant, you know, to yes. convey complex concept to people in a simple way. So, uh, Noah was informed that there was going to be a storm that would uh, at, um, basically kill everyone that were present. So, he took uh, every one of its kind uh, in a uh, ark, made it, and made it so strong that it could survive through the whole turbulence uh, even after the uh, storm was over. And then they had gone and settled to the other, this thing. And we are all? Th those kinds. Progeny. Progeny of those kinds that okay. he took. Okay. Wonderful. Chalo. Next. Who can recognize this? This from another religious belief. Another, another faith. What is this? Kya dikh raha hai Very what is the what is the feel of this you know how does this picture give you a feel serene huh? very nice flow serene flow what is the concept of paradise what is the concept of paradise in islam any muslim participants is not beyond horizon there. Paradise is some place which is nourishing, which you enjoy. What is the, what is the core concept of Jannat? <laughs> Where there is no any difficulty, everything is in peace, everything is good. The idea of Jannat is twofold. One is that there will be flowing water nice flowing water and that there will be plenty full of nourishment fresh fruit good positive environment around bird singing okay nourishing place a pleasing place a nourishing place where there is a flow so whether it is actually the hindu mythology or the christian mythology or the muslim faith everywhere people have used you know this flow nice flow as the example for the for the type of state that we want to experience serenity not sereness not sereness okay we wanted to all experience this nice flow this nice serenity you know because it is so positive you feel good about it it makes you feel joyful and on the other hand they have shown you know that how the turbulence is sort of you know affecting you how the stagnation is sort of affecting you. So they are all prodding you to get yourself into this nice flow. Symbolic way, simple way to make, you know, this concept understandable to the lay persons. Next one. Abhi hai, exercise mein jayenga apart. So, first thing second. I would like you people, if you are interested, uh, is the concept of flow in positive psychology. There is a book called Flow Itself by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, Mihai C. His name is very difficult to pronounce, but he is the pioneer of what is called as the positive psychology movement. So he has written a book called Flow. It's available. It's on Amazon. It's everywhere. It's a very, I mean, it's a based on a very painstaking series of experiments that he conducted across many years in people. And the simple question he asked was, when do you feel happy? And people described uh, when I am eating, when I am drinking, when I am doing whatever. Uh, surprisingly, maybe the first two are not surprising. The first two situations in which people were very happy was in the creative pursuits, music, dance, sports. Surprisingly, the third was work. The third place where people said, I am in this process of flow is work. And he has defined this as a state of 
something that he calls as self-sustaining without external goal. That there is no, I am not doing it for the money, not doing it for adulation, I am doing it just for the sake of itself, intrinsic motivation. That is what he called as flow. And for this two things need to be there. One is a challenge. It needs to be challenging. Second is you have to have a set of skills which is equal to the challenge. Only then this test can come. So there has to be a problem, but you have to be equal to the problem. So when people are cracking a very difficult puzzle, when Roger Federer is playing tennis, you know, when Tendulkar is playing cricket, when Lata Mangeshkar is singing, they are not singing for you. We may enjoy it, it's a different issue. They are singing to see how perfect they can be in what they do. Now that is flow. And that is why when these older musicians get very disturbed if somebody takes a mobile, you know, we see, may, may see it as arrogance, but because they need that perfect state of concentration to match what they have set for themselves. They are not trying to please you. you know. So this is flow and it's very wonderfully explained by Mihai in that book that he in fact says in that book, this was uh, written in 1990, that yoga is the most systematic way of producing this experience. And he says the western world till now has not come up with an equivalent of yoga to produce this kind of a flow experience. So it's uh, in, in that book, it's a very wonderful book if all of you want to read. It's a sort of other figure of the field of positive psychology. Yes. Okay. Anyway, good. So quickly recap, you know, we already now you are already there, you know all these points already, you know, that we are looking at health as a whole, mind, body, inseparable, that health is the dimension, you can go progressively worsening health, but if you make effort, you also have a possibility to sort of travel back. And uh, individual and environment interaction, so external disturbance, internal disturbance, whatever the source, but there is a interaction. Let us now go to our first set of uh, exercises quickly after this next one. So we are now interested in this clear agenda that we want to have health regulation by self. Then we will also later part quickly talk about what are the health universals, you know, which all of us need to have and how to particularize, you know, these ideas, this concept, how shall I apply to myself, my particular situation. Okay. Now the first, first prerequisite for health regulation, our own health regulation is that we need to have the insight or we need to perceive, you know, what kind of a state I am in. Now, as I said that what kind of state my rhythms, body rhythms are in, what kind of state I am generally in. I should be able to perceive that, you know, because if I am not trained, I am not able to perceive that, I cannot make a correction. Something which I cannot perceive, I can make no 